Anna, your kind of initial reaction to the news of the arrest of Matteo Messino Denaro, um, unexpected, I'm sure, but somebody like yourself who understands the mechanisms of the mafia and the idea that the takedown of one godfather probably isn't going to exactly rock the boat completely. But just maybe just tell me what you felt first when you heard the story. So I felt um, I didn't believe it. I thought it was an ox. And that's because it happened already three times that I, I can recall that the news have launched this breaking news. Matteo Messina Denaro has been caught uh, in the past. It turns out one time it was a uh, someone that had nothing to do with him in a restaurant in the Netherlands. Another time was someone else in Liverpool uh, during, uh, I think, a Formula One. Um, so it, it's I thought it was an ox. I actually thought it's like, OK, come on, yet again. And the reason why I thought that is because the day before, the 15th of January, uh, we celebrated, if we can say that, in Italy, 30 years since the arrest of Totorina, who was the boss of the bosses of Cosa Nostra. So there was a lot of talk about Matteo Messina Denaro the day before, and it looks so coincidental. It's like, oh, come, come on, we've been talking about this guy until last night, and now they caught him. So that's why. But then obviously, um, the more the news got confirmed, the more it seemed, you know, OK, that's the real deal. It's funny you should say that because I think people involved in organised crime and those who know a little bit about it, maybe who write about it or work around it, don't believe coincidences exist. Yes, we tend to be quite uh, conspiratorial in that sense, in a good sense, I guess. But uh, I can tell you we are not enough. We are not alone in Italy. The, at this stage, the debate is going completely on the conspiracy side uh, for good reasons, obviously, including the, co the coincidence of uh, the date, um, but also a number of other things that in this uh, arrest didn't quite fit uh, in. And we know, as you said at the beginning, how this arrest works. Um, it's not the first time that a mafia boss of this caliber is arrested in Sicily. We have at least other two examples of it uh, in the near past. So, um, yeah, it, there are some things that we're still wondering about on how this all happened. And of course, if we take ourselves across the world briefly before we come back to Sicily in Mexico recently, the arrest of El Chapo's son, the drama of it. And you, lo you look at the political, you know, what's happening around that politically. And of course, it's it's to do, they say, with Biden. Um, and yes, there's certainly, you know, when it comes to these big operations to bring down or to bring in these major organized criminals, it ultimately is political because there has to be um, at the very least a nod for the finances it takes. You know, there isn't luck with this kind of thing. But let's start with the background of Denaro. His father was the capo of, I'll let you actually explain it and pronounce the words. So go ahead. It can be a bit complicated. So Matteo Messina Denaro uh, is the son of Francesco Matteo Messina Denaro, uh, who was the boss of the province of Trapani. Trapani is a beautiful place, part of Sicily in the western part of the, the island just below Palermo. And Francesco Messina Denaro made a good choice in life, which was to side uh, on the side of the winner, to side with the winner. The winner at the time was Toto Riina. Salvatore Riina was the quintessential image of, the, of Cosa Nostra in Sicily, was a very, how can I put it nicely, <laughs> a very strange man, he believed, uh, he wanted to get uh, to the top of uh, Cosa Nostra. He had very clear ideas of what Cosa Nostra looked like. And uh, he essentially killed everyone around him who didn't approve of his uh, choice. So he started off a mafia war uh, between his clan, the Corleonesi, from the town of Corleone in the province of Palermo, and the Palermo-based um, clans, which are notoriously the more uh, important he won the war and the people who supported him, including Francesco Messina Denaro, won with him. Uh, so essentially this created a new season of Cosa Nostra 
bosses who were extremely militarized in the sense that they use uh, weapons quite um, briefly. Uh, and they essentially created this sort of, you know, unique form of power under Totorina um, protection and guidance. And Matteo Messina Denaro became the protege of Totorina. He was young compared to the rest. He was barely 30. At the time, he had already been um, participating to the upper end of activities of Cosa Nostra because of his father. And when his father died, he became um, the boss of the province uh, and obviously of his town, Castelvetrano, where he was caught eventually. So Matteo Messina Denaro was supposed to be the future of Cosa Nostra for Totorina. Obviously, Totorina couldn't possibly fathom the idea that this uh, strategy would not work and that everyone was going to be arrested, even if it took 30 years. Mm. And just, you know, going back before this war and before Denaro becomes the, the boss of bosses, going right back because the Mafia was born in Sicily and it was born way back before sort of what normal people would think organized crime emerged out of the, you know, the drugs and, and all the rest of it. It goes way back to, the, I think, the 18th century when Sicily was ruled by different countries and where Sicilians basically rose up against what they saw as oppressors and started forming gangs and groupings themselves and policing their own environment. And where Omerta was uh, for, first born. And I think then that when Sicily became part of Italy, um, those sort of warlords and those gangs remained and they had become very entrenched at that point. Yeah, so the start of the mafia is very mythological in this sense, because obviously we, it's, a, it's a social process, we don't have a birthday. However, we know that the, a couple of things converged in the same time. First of all, uh, as you said, the unification of Italy, which didn't bring uh, much unification to Sicily. Um, on the one end. On the other hand, the end of feudalism, so the breaking down of um, property rights of those families who had uh, notoriously and historically held a lot of um, land, uh, and this land was, the, the rules around land ownership changed, and obviously this created a sense of impoverishment and entitlement in some uh, of the, let's say, bourgeoisie class. Um, in academia, uh, the most obvious way of defining mafias is an industry of private protection, whereby you turn to the people who are close to you for mind and for um, geography to give you the protection that you can't find elsewhere. So it's not a substitution of the state, it's together with the state. The state cannot reach every single angle. Um, so mafias are, were not obviously always criminals. Uh, I think that's uh, that's a misconception that many people have. Uh, there is nothing criminal in offering protection in that sense uh, of human security. What became criminal was obviously asking for something in return and this something in return becoming something illicit. And then obviously um, becoming in a way diversifying the portfolios of activities and unify, making, let's say, the protection money on the one hand uh, invested in other uh, forms of crime on the other end, including eventually in the uh, in the mid of the 20th century drugs. So it, things happen for bit in a mix between people's charisma on the one end, some of the bosses of Cosa Nostra are very well known for that, uh, some of the early chances of globalization, let's not forget America here, and the chances to establish a Pan-American Sicilian um, partnership, however that went, uh, and clearly the lack of uniformity in the way Sicily evolved uh, together with the rest of uh, Italy. But I wouldn't say just Sicily, it's something from the south. We have uh, and still open, we call it questione meridionale, the southerner question, uh, which is what happened in the south of Italy that we are not the same <laughs> as, as the other Italian. And it's a long, long question which we don't want to get into, but you know. And Northern Italy tends to be very industrialized and where all the big business is, is that right? And then the South is kind of farmers and, 
you know. There are businesses in Calabria, in Sicily, in the Puglia. The situation is not obviously the same as it used to be. Uh, however, there is a lot of resistance in abandoning certain logics uh, of um, clientelism and patronage, I say, the, which mm. are eventually part, not just the, not the only reason why, but part of the reason why mafias are still uh, born in the South. Yeah, yeah. I've been to Sicily a good few times. Um, haven't yet made it to Palermo, but I intend to go. But Palermo is the most beautiful city. Beautiful. I'm honest. I'm going in a month and I can't wait. I absolutely Lovely. adore it. No, it's beautiful. But you know what I what I find sometimes is that you go. I mean, this is just purely from a tourism point of view. You go and you book a hotel, you're paying a lot of money and you don't seem to be getting much bang for your book. And I was always told that um, it's because of protection, because of the extent of the tentacles of the mafia, that a lot of businesses are paying money. People don't really want to be businesses, don't really want to be seen to be you know, wealthy because they're going to come after them. I mean, it always sounded a little bit similar to sort of um, certainly the drug dealers here with the IRA who they always went after anybody who was showing money. Maybe that's incorrect, but it was just well, said yeah, a number of times. It could be, it could be correct in some instances, in some other instances, it could just be, you know, it's, it's very Talk. difficult to differentiate um, mafia behaviours or mafia fueled behaviors from mafia from expectations of mafia behavior. People might do things not because the mafia is asking them to, but because they fear they will be asked to. So it's quite controversial, I guess, yeah, to yeah. to separate Sicilians or Calabrians from and their behaviors from mafia behaviors. It's very difficult. Mm. Anyway, one way or another, it's a beautiful part of the world and tourism is clearly one of the the big industries and I'm sure loads of people in Ireland have been or intend to go um, we'll go back to because we've kind of slightly gone off uh, track there but and that's my fault but Denaro what happens in the early 1990s 92 93 that the Sicilian government decide to go after to try and break the mafias and in doing so um, they have to make them turn against one another these are criminal groupings with quite tight blood bonds and familial bonds and um, they bring them in in their droves. I mean, hundreds of them are brought before the the courts. courts. Yes. So um, first of all, it wasn't the Sicilian government. (laughs) Sorry to disappoint. Uh, It was the Sicilian magistrates and then eventually the Italian government. So the um, breaking point of Cosa Nostra is the Maxi Trial. The Maxi Trial that um, started in, in, well, ended in 1989 and then eventually became a definite sentence in 1992, January 1992, um, was eventually um, the coming out of the mind of one man who is Giovanni Falcone. Giovanni Falcone is Italy's most well-known hero. He died at the end of Cosa Nostra, blown up uh, in the so-called Strage di Capaci in uh, May 1992. And together with his colleagues, uh, including Paolo Borsellino and under uh, Rocco Chinnici, who was at the time in the 80s uh, heading the Inquisitorial Office of Palermo, uh, he basically started to ideate, I understand how the hell do we go against a group that is so tight, as you said, that is so embedded in the region uh, and not just in the region at the time we were already evolving uh, Cosa Nostra was already evolved into Italy into the world and he uh, he created the so-called Falcone method which is still today used throughout the world is the basis of the United Nations uh, of uh, transnational organized crime convention which is to go after the money now we keep saying this going after the money but it wasn't like that until the 80s um so he created a way an actual way to go after the money which i won't bore you with the technical details um and which involved uh america which involved the rest of europe and he brought behind well in front of the courts over 400 people and uh, a lot the majority of these 400 people were convicted. At the time, the mafia offense was new. We had a mafia membership offense in Italy since 1992. Um, He used it for the first time in the Maxi trial, it sticks. And uh, this was a massive blow because we are not just talking here about soldiers, we were talking about heads of the mafia. 
um, Totori Ina at the time, again, the boss of um, Cosa Nostra was a very ruthless man. And he was confident that like he did in the past, he could overthrow, he could over overturn the trial. He, he promised his people that he could corrupt enough people, corrupt enough judges, and this trial is not gonna stand. Not at, at, at the end of it, not in the Supreme Court. And he was wrong. So the moment in which he was clear that the trial uh, sentences were gonna stick, including his own, um, he eventually lost it. <laughs> and he lost it by doing what he did best, which is to start killing people. So he started a sort of, um, I don't even, a war eventually has been described against the state. And he started not just killing um, people among, you know, close to him or spreading blood in the streets of Palermo as he had done in the past, but he targeted the so-called excellent uh, people. We call them excellent cadavers as well, excellent corpses. Uh, which eventually was had to start with um, Giovanni Falcone in the 90s, but had already started with other people killed who were trying to fight mafias in the 80s, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa, Rocco Chinnici himself, the boss of Giovanni Falcone. But obviously after the trial, the maxi trial ended, to attack Falcone had become the quintessential mission of Totorina, and he succeeded. He did that with a number of other people, including the Graviano brothers, including Leo Luca Bagarella, who was his um, uh, brother-in-law, and Matteo Messina Denaro. So he did that with just a, an, a handful of people who were at the time the boss of various parts of Cosa Nostra, various sections of Cosa Nostra, uh, who were with him convinced that if you want to have anything from the state, you have to attack. And that's what he did. And Anna, just to, you know, I suppose, focus on that for a minute, because Falcone was blown up along with, I think, his wife and five of his police who were bo who were minding him, the bodyguards. I mean, you, you'd like to think if you had five bodyguards, you, you should be able to move around at least. But he blew up a bridge and uh, as he was traveling over it, is that, that right? And then a piece of the motorway was blown up and, and he was killed in it. But, you know, the loss of life, the loss of those heroes, you know, of Italy's future, really, and your future generations who want to live outside of that stranglehold of organized crime. What they also did was create a fear and in, in doing that. So, you know, if you're a magistrate, if you're trying to do right, you know, not everybody is going to be brave enough really to work in a life or death situation. And that fear that they create destroys the structures of society even more. Yes, at the time, uh, Cosa Nostra became a terror organization, essentially, which was very unusual for Cosa Nostra and for other mafias. It was never normally like that. Organized crime and terrorism are not that similar in Italy. Um, so it became, it had two effects. One, uh, it prompted finally, <laughs> finally, the state, the national state to start reacting. And he created an outpour of support from civil society. People marched and they called out names and they organized into what became the first NGO, uh, Libera, uh, against mafias in Italy, which is still today the biggest one. Um, so the reaction was fierce. And yes, it was, it became very obvious that we always say this in Italian, um, that they shouldn't have be, they shouldn't have been left alone these judges, and yet they were. And the reason why they were has to do with politics, with their positions, with, you know, the little nitty gritty things of small people in small places. Um, but it became very obvious uh, that in situations like this, with mafias that become or can grow like this, you mm. can't leave these people alone. You can't, it's, the state is not enough. People need to be along the state, but more importantly, the state has, you can't have only one person fight is not sustainable for anyone. Yeah. And, you know, I suppose it's a lesson as well, uh, 
to other countries across Europe and here as well to try and stem the growth of organised crime. Everybody says we're never going to win the war against drugs. We're never going to win the war against organised crime. Absolutely not. But you cannot let it take that grip of a country and, you know, the corruption that comes with it. So each mafia or, you know, criminal organisation that is taken down while another one will grow, you just have to keep at it. It's like weeding a garden. If I can add to that, um, 1992 in Italy is the year of insanity. I I mean, oh, now we are only talking about, only, <laughs> we are talking about uh, major bombings and major uh, murders, but the year, the 1992, starts in January with the confirmation of the Maxi trial. In February, the biggest scandal of corruption of the world erupts in Italy, the one that is commonly called Tangentopoli, Bribesville, where pretty much um, all of Italian states were found to be using systemic corruption um, to proceed with their daily life. It was the biggest political corruption scandal, again, of the world until today. And this uh, very much involved Rome, it involved Sicily, it involved mafias, it involved anyone uh, who had any say in the underworld in Italy. Then in May, Giovanni Falcone is killed. In July, Paolo Borsellino is killed. We have a period which I only remember as a child, uh, so I can't possibly comment with my own individual memories, but we had a period where um, that year really pushed to change. It couldn't have been anywhere else. We were descending into some sort of darkness. It was impossible to sustain. So the amount, the level of corruption, the level of organized crime grip on the territory, the level of terror was enough, I think, to for people to react. And when you talk about you were descending into that level of darkness, do you think had it not you know, had the state not stood up to it at that point, um, it would have been a similar situation to what's ha- what we see in the likes of Mexico, where the corruption is just so embedded, it's in every part of existence. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think in a way this was our, it's, it's awful to say, but this was our lucky charm. Uh, and it's awful to say because obviously people died in between, but uh, the mist- the um, highest peak of Cosa Nostra was also his demise. The highest peak of Totori Ina is his most, uh, how can I put it, his uh, is most terrible moment, his moment of realization, the murders of the judges was eventually was brought him down. And uh, history teaches us um, that clearly it's not enough to bring down a man, but in that case, the symbol, the symbolic meaning of bringing down that man for Italy was the beginning of a much more successful period of Mm -hmm. obviously not eradicating organized crime, very, very far from it, not eradicating corruption either, but clearly at least creating sides. And that was, I think, missing at least in a certain part of, the South. And no doubt what has happened since is a whole other, uh, you know, something that we couldn't even cope with on a podcast. It's books, it's, you know, academic studies, etc. So f- for our part today, let's stick with Denaro. You said he was one of those that was involved in those dreadful murders of Falcone and, and others. He was wanted and he was jailed in his absence by a court for his was it for his role in the murder of Falcone? Yes. He has he has been sentenced for several murders, um, but obviously also for co-participating um together with the others in the setting up of the murder of Falcone Borsellino and the bodyguards and the wife of Falcone. So um Matteo Messina Denaro, as I said, was the youngest at the time. Um, and this is not, I keep repeating this because I think it's important, is not, he was seen as the one who was supposed to continue uh, Rina's work. Rina himself, in jail, expressed resentment against Matteo Messina Denaro because he had agreed to do what all the others had agreed to do, which is to disappear. He was very disappointed in him. And uh, because he was supposed to be the bridging boss Mm -hmm. the boss who bridged the new generation of people brought up by rina and the old generation like 
his father, man of honor of the previous era. So Messina Denaro to once um, Reina get arrested in January 1993. Um, we have a period in which the bombings do not stop. We have three more incidents at the very least in, in uh, Rome, Milan and Florence, people dying again for bombs placed by Cosa Nostra. This has all been uh, resulted in trials and sentences uh, and eventually brings down some of the members of the remaining circle of the Reina, apart from Messina Denaro. He disappears in the summer autumn of 1993 to only reappear a few days ago. So Messina Denaro eventually marries this idea of submersion. He understands they cannot go on like that. And he disappears smartly, I would say, more than others uh, in that sense. Um, but in so doing, he perpetuates the myth of Cosa Nostra being invincible, of Cosa Nostra being, you know, uh, in continuation from its past. So the meaning of this, this arrest is not because he's the last one standing. Yes, okay, that's great that the state finally gets to jail him, but it's really the fact that with him in jail, a period of Italy gets closed after 30 yeah. years, but it does get closed, or at the very least, another chapter opens. But that one, for now, is closed. And I think that's the symbolic, uh, that's the meaning of his being on the run for 30 years, apart from the fact that obviously he was a wanted man and he had to serve time in jail. Which... Now, like any person that goes missing, uh, or sorry, unlike any person that goes missing, um, you know, I suppose a normal individual operating in the ordinary world that goes missing, we check their credit cards to see if they used it, if they've shown up anywhere, there may be sightings of them, whatever. Presumably, Denaro, given that he's wanted to serve life in prison, isn't going to use his own name or he's just literally going to go to ground. So over the last 30 years, did you know he was alive or was there suspicions that you know, he had been disappeared, essentially, which is a, an IRA term, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think there was ever, and there was never anyone who, have, who actually believed that he had disappeared uh, in the sense of dying. Um, there were many uh, speculations on whether or not he had plastic surgery, whether or not his face looked the same, whether or not his voice looked the, the sounds that sounded the same. Let's not forget the police never had the DNA, uh, sorry, never had the fingerprints of Medicina Denaro because he was never jailed. Uh, they only had a piece of his D DNA. Uh, so eventually some sort of confrontation was going to be possible. But no, most of the speculation were uh, either attempts to mess with the investigation. So a sighting of him in Brazil, another sighting of him in Germany, another sighting of him God knows where. Uh, or uh, rumors, rumors that he was sick. I've heard this rumor that he was sick, I think, before the pandemic. Someone had said or someone had, was intercepted saying that they have heard that, you know, people heard that he was sick and blah, blah, blah. So this idea that he was sick eventually made us kind of assume that if anything, at some point, he would turn up dead. But then they caught him. So, and they caught him next door to his house. <laughs> Essentially, they caught him at home, which doesn't say, doesn't mean that he was always at home, but it means that that's where he comes back when he needs to be safe, uh, like every mafia boss. You are no one outside of your feud. You are home. When you're home, you're someone. Outside of home, you're no one. And that's, I think, something that Messina Denaro confirms quite clearly. Are also that sometimes the best place to hide is in plain sight because, you know, somebody in an environment that they don't belong stands out. Um, it strikes me he had the same, like, I don't know whether Whitey Bulger was 30 years on the run, but he was certainly a long time on the run. Whitey Bulger being wanted in Boston, the head of the Winter Hill Gang, the Irish mafia boss essentially from Boston who had... Uh, worked with corrupt cops and disappeared just as, as the authorities were about to uh, arrest him. And he was certainly 18, 20 years on the run, but sure, he was seen all over the world. There were sightings of him everywhere. And ultimately, he was found in the US with a partner. Um, and there had been no plastic surgery or anything like it. He had just grown old as normal. But um, Denaro, I suppose it's part of the... 
a confidence you have and you gain if you're trying to live undercover, um, you know, and maybe within your own environment. But it is hard to believe without that in his own neighborhood, people wouldn't have recognized him as he's going out and about because he seemed to have been going for coffee and. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't seem to be hiding, which I think is uh, is the essence of his uh, his person. So Messina Denaro was well known before he disappeared for enjoying life. He was a womanizer um, and he was someone who enjoyed um, luxury goods. Um, he was always well dressed. He was the most well dressed of market bosses, if that means anything. Um, so he enjoyed, you know, going out and being seen. So it's very difficult, I guess, for someone with that kind of characteristic uh, to go completely undetected. Um, so probably some personality traits there also played a role. But also, mm -hmm. I think uh, because he probably didn't stay uh, in Castelvetrano or in Trapani or in Palermo for the whole time, um, I think it became his mythology, the mythology around him became so much that even if people at the bar thought, oh, maybe that looks a little bit like Messina Denaro, they probably told themselves, now come on, come, they can't be. Seriously, the most wanted man is here sitting next to me. On the one end, on the other hand, it might have been fear. It's like, okay, so if this is Matteo Messina Denaro, should I should it be me to tell something to the police? What if he comes after me? So it's it's something not to forget. Obviously, that the reason why Messina Denaro was in Trapani and was protected was because he was the boss, and a very mm -hmm. very violent one. So I don't think we can be too judgmental on people. Uh, around the area because on the one end it's very unbelievable that you the person you have in front of you is really him and on the other side there are complications and the people in that area know it very well that it's better if you mind your own business and this is the meaning of omerta it's not that everyone wanted to protect him or everyone had something to gain sometimes it's just minding your own business is a rational choice in a way and I suppose, Anna, the other thing is that, you know, he was probably the most known face back in the early 90s. But that is quite a long time ago. And the new generation are living in a completely different world, really. And maybe his name isn't so familiar to them or his face isn't so familiar to them. A certain generation, obviously, because of what he did and what he was involved in, that seminal moment of 1992 when Italy stood up against the Mafia um, and obviously it's part of your work and your interests so you would be somebody who'd be very familiar with who he is etc but you know it's that idea of living in plain sight that people aren't thinking of, of who he is you know and no doubt as the weeks and months go on we will start to or the, the authorities will start to unravel where he's been who he's been in contact with and you know, if people have been protecting him, is there a he's he's obviously gone in to serve these prison terms that he had already been convicted of in absentia. So his future is mapped out. Yeah, his future is mapped out uh, and, and so will his past very soon. So he's already been uh, moved to uh, the 41 bis, uh, which is the Italian prison regime for mafia bosses in the prison of L'Aquila in the center of Italy, where there are many other like him, which is a pretty, pretty much permanent isolation um, kind of um, regime with only one visit per month and only national television and not regional one to avoid um, messages sent to him. Yeah. Um, but he's very sick. So he has a very advanced form of cancer and uh, they have agreed to treat him uh, directly in the prison. Uh, but it might be the case that he has to receive some external treatment the more, the more he gets closer to death because he, they are the his doctors or the doctors who, has, who have seen his conditions are adamant that he has not that much to live, which by the way, could have played a role into his arrest. So, so far we have found two of his uh, hideouts. There weren't much of hideouts, to be honest. One was a house <laughs> that was um, bought by the man he pretended to be. He pretended to be Andrea Bonafede. The real Andrea Bonafede bought the house for him. Um, and uh, he, they found 
normality in that house. They found, you know, even condoms and uh, Viagra, which sounded interesting. So he clearly was seeing other people outside of his circle. And uh, they found books and they found, you know, evidence that he was moving around. Then they found another hideout, a bit more of a bunker-like, uh, very close to the previous one, where eventually he could have probably planned to hide if things went south. Um, but it didn't see. It doesn't seem like he's been, at least in the past year, when his condition of health have deteriorated and he decided clearly to move back uh, for good. It doesn't seem like he has been, um, you know, refraining from going out or anything like that. So he either um, assumed that no one would recognize him, or he assumed, and that's you know the sense of grandeur that these people have, or he he had taken into account that his time was up, which seemed reasonable if you think that he's at the end of his life eventually, health wise. And that he wanted to come home. I wonder somebody like Denaro, who is responsible for so many deaths and also there was, I think, a kidnap and torture of a 12 year old boy because his father had given evidence um, that it was a very distressing story to even read about. Um, the child was held for a long period of time and tortured. I think it's a difficult question, obviously, because we are not those people, but um, he's a mafia boss uh, and mafia bosses have a way of um, dissimulating of their, all that they have done to justify and neutralize in the most classic way of neutralization techniques, all that they have done. Not that necessarily you can even, I can't even find, think of a way to neutralize the fact that you have dissolved into acid a boy you were um, holding hostage for over two years for no reason whatsoever but to punish his father um, but mafia bosses are not psychopath in that sense uh, or sociopath um, assuming um, you know that everyone is aware of the difference but um, it, it's more about living extremely wrapped up in your world and in your world things make sense because you have this sort of um you have make a choice you have made a choice a long time ago to essentially stay on that side i i know it sounds very abstract but i think mafias are at the very top of their manifestations like this one somewhere like a cult where um the cult leader which definitely someone like Messina Denaro is, believes in a few things. One, order. Anything that upsets my order needs to go. I need order. Uh, and order also means that if someone turns against me, I have to punish him because that's order, restoring order. Restoring honor and honor means um, a number of things are not allowed because they're dishonorable. Uh, then obviously in practice they have rules for themselves and rules for others because clearly that's obviously the beauty of it but there are a couple of tenets which justify everything they do so and definitely order the old bosses of Cosa Nostra had this obsession with order um, and eventually they created more chaos than anyone else in the name of order so I don't know what he's thinking now but surely so in a way, you say they sort of rationalize themselves in that they're almost at war in a, in a, their life is, is a war against society and the norms that the rest of us live under. Probably, yes. I mean, we'll mm. see because Messina Denaro has refused to already given signs that he's not going to talk which is very obvious in a way because he's Matteo Messina Denaro and if he wanted to talk, he had 30 years to start. Um, but uh, this will only, um, and I'm sorry to say this, but this will only fuel more conspiracies. Matteo Messina Denaro is believed to be the last one knowing certain secrets, the secrets of Totorina, the secrets of Bernardo Provenzano, the bosses before him, the secrets of Berlusconi and the help of Berlusconi to the Mafia and Rina and the secrets of uh, the collapse of the first Italian Republic with Berlusconi and the helpers 
of the political helpers of um, the killings of Paolo Borsellino, those who created, who basically made it impossible to discover the truth. He's supposed to know all that. He's supposed to have the archive of Totorina. He's supposed to, supposed to have a red agenda that belonged to Paolo Borsellino that disappeared on the day of his murder. He's supposed to be the gatekeeper of all of this knowledge. And he's gonna probably die without saying a word. So um, in a way, this will only preserve the conspiracy. And uh, Italy, in this sense, will never get past this. Well, Anna, thank you very much for imparting a small amount of your vast knowledge on this subject today. Um, And hopefully we will have some understanding of the enormity of the arrest of Denaro to Italians and to the people who have been who have suffered at the hands of the mafia. Uh, So thank you very much.